Okay, so if the first derivative of a function, dy dx, is positive, then that means that our function is increasing at a point. If the first derivative is negative somewhere, then our function is decreasing there. You might also know that if the second derivative is positive, then our function is convex, and if the second derivative is negative, then our function is concave. This describes the curvature of our function. So what about the third derivative? To understand the third derivative, it might be helpful to think of our function as being a displacement time graph. So the first derivative is velocity, the second derivative is acceleration, then our third derivative would represent the rate of change of acceleration. We'll have a go at sketching this. So let's assume that the third derivative is positive, and we'll also say that the acceleration, the second derivative, is positive. So what happens here? We start off, we're accelerating maybe a little bit, and then as we go further along, our acceleration is getting bigger and bigger. So to begin with, we're maybe not accelerating that much, but as we go further along, you can see we start to get more and more curved. Our acceleration increases as we go along. If we were decelerating, so if the second derivative was negative, our acceleration was negative, but the third derivative was positive, let's say numerically, perhaps our acceleration is minus 10, then it goes up to minus 9, up to minus 8, and so on then what would this look like? Our absolute value of the acceleration would actually be getting smaller. So it would seem like in the beginning perhaps we're accelerating a lot and then leveling off as we go further along. You can see our function is somehow stretched out a bit towards the right here, and here it's stretched out towards the left. What about when the third derivative is negative then? So again we'll split up into these two different cases. So if our acceleration is positive but our rate of change of acceleration is negative, this means we perhaps start off we're accelerating a lot, but then as we go further along, our acceleration becomes less and less and we become more leveled out like this. If the second derivative was negative and the third derivative is negative, this means that perhaps we start off our acceleration is minus 10, it goes to minus 11, minus 12, so the absolute value of our acceleration would actually be increasing here. So it might be like this where we start off, it doesn't seem like we're accelerating that much, and the absolute value of our acceleration would get more and more. So there seems to be this idea that somehow we're stretched out one way or another depending on the sign of the third derivative relative to the second derivative. So this is all a bit vague at the moment, but there's a nice geometric way of capturing this. If we focus on a specific point on our function, let's draw in a tangent to that point, and we'll also draw in the normal to our function at that point. The next thing we're going to do is just draw some chords to our function which are parallel to the tangent. So let's draw one here. We'll draw a few more here, and one more there. And to capture this idea of the function being somehow spread out, stretched out towards the left, we can look at the midpoints of these chords. So the midpoint of this one is over here on the left, this one's here, and the midpoints, they get closer and closer to this point as our chords get closer. But what's really important here is the third derivative is positive, and they seem to be over on the left. Let's have a look at this upside down picture where the second derivative was negative. If we draw our tangent and our normal, we'll draw in a couple more chords, and you can see that the midpoints of each of these chords, these are now going to be over on the right hand side of the normal, so perhaps it's more meaningful to say actually we're going anti-clockwise from this inward facing normal with these midpoints as we approach the point. So what about when the third derivative is negative? Here we're going anti-clockwise, and it turns out that our midpoints of the chords are going to be clockwise of the normal in this scenario where the third derivative is negative. So we just draw in a couple of chords here. You can see that because we're now stretched out in the other direction to the right, the midpoints are over on the right hand side of our normal, so they're clockwise round from the normal here. And then just for completion, let's draw the tangent and normal to our point here. Draw in a couple more chords parallel to our tangent. And you'll see that, once again, our midpoints are going to be over, they're actually on the left here, but what's more important is that they're clockwise of the normal when the third derivative is negative, and they're anti-clockwise of this inward-facing normal when the third derivative is positive. And to convince you further, we're going to have a look at a heavily simplified proof of this property. So there are a few simplifying assumptions that we'll make. The first thing that we can notice here is that if we move our graph of our function left, right, up and down, this property of being clockwise, anti-clockwise of our inward facing normal is invariant under translation. So as we move around, nothing changes there. So without any loss of generality there, we can assume that our point of interest is going to be zero. But not only that, we'll also assume that our function actually passes through the origins. We can just move this around and nothing changes about this property we're interested in. 
We'll also notice here that if we were to rotate our function, then this would also still be anti-clockwise of the normal and our midpoints would be clockwise of the inward facing normal in this other scenario. So we can actually rotate the function round and we'll do this so that the derivative is then equal to zero at our point. So it's just the tangent is horizontal there, and the normal will be vertical. And not only that, but we'll also make an assumption on the second derivative, which is just that if we were to get a concave function, we'll turn this upside down, rotate 180 degrees, so that the second derivative is now positive. So we're going to omit the case where the second derivative is allowed to be equal to zero, and this is because this geometric interpretation, if you're allowed to have a point of inflection, then this all kind of breaks down now because we're reliant on having this inward facing normal, but it's not clear which normal is facing in towards your function if you allow a point of inflection. So just for simplicity, we're going to omit the case where the second derivative is equal to zero. So let's just draw a new picture to see what's going on when the third derivative is positive. So we're hoping for something where our function is somehow stretched out towards the left. Now it passes through the origin and this is nice because our chords are now just horizontal lines. But even so, it's not going to work with exactly this scenario proving that these chords midpoints are on the left of the y-axis. What we'll actually do is work with another equivalent scenario, which is just a little bit nicer to work with. So if I copy the drawing again here, what we'll do is instead of having chords where they're at the same height, we'll have chords which are the same distance away from the y-axis. So if we say this point here is epsilon and this point is minus epsilon, the same distance away, if we were to draw in a chord now, you'll see here that because this has been stretched out to the left when the third derivative is positive, we're not quite as high up on the left-hand side. So it seems that the gradient of this chord is positive when the third derivative is positive. If we go a little bit closer, we'll have a smaller value of epsilon. Again, the gradient is slightly positive here. So it seems that the gradient of this chord needs to be positive when the third derivative is positive. If we look at the case where our third derivative is negative, we're stretched out over to the right now, and what we're looking at is the reverse of this picture. So if we were to draw in a chord at epsilon and minus epsilon here, what we'll get is something which has now got a negative gradient, and similarly as we move closer to the origin we still have a slightly negative gradient at two equidistant points. So the claim, what we're actually going to try and prove here is that the gradient of these chords is positive when the third derivative is positive and the gradient is negative when the third derivative is negative. Hopefully you can see that this is somehow equivalent to these midpoints being on the left or being on the right under all of our simplifying assumptions. So the claim then is that the gradient of this chord, so this is really nice because we can just write this as f of epsilon minus f of minus epsilon, your change in y divided by your change in x. So f of epsilon minus f of minus epsilon, change in y divided by your change in x is just 2 epsilon. We're saying that this is greater than 0 when third derivative, so we'll call it now f prime 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 0 is positive. We're going to say that this is negative when the third derivative at 0 is negative. So we need our function to be thrice differentiable for this third derivative term to even exist, but we'll also add the assumption that it has a valid Taylor series expansion at zero, which is nice because it means that we can write in a neighbourhood of zero f of x as this sum plus some higher order terms. Now our simplifying assumptions are particularly helpful here. We know that f of zero is zero, and also the first derivative at zero is also zero, so we can get rid of these two. And this is particularly helpful now when we substitute all of this into this expression, so f of epsilon minus f of minus epsilon divided by 2 epsilon, what do we get now? So our f of epsilon term starts with the second derivative term of epsilon squared over 2 factorial plus the third derivative term with epsilon cubed over 3 factorial plus some higher order terms. Don't forget all of this is being divided by 2 epsilon. Then we take away our f of minus epsilon terms, we get the same things but with minus epsilon substituted in, divide this by 2 factorial plus the third derivative term with minus epsilon cubed all over 3 factorial plus our higher order terms. Don't forget to divide this by 2 epsilon. So here you'll see that these two terms are actually going to cancel with each other, so minus minus epsilon squared just gives us a minus epsilon squared which cancels exactly with this term, so that's nice. So you can see that our highest order term 
is going to be the epsilon cubed divided by epsilon terms there. So combining these together, what do we get? We have the third derivative, then we have epsilon squared divided by 2 times 3 factorial. And we actually get the exact same term, so minus minus epsilon cubed gives us plus epsilon cubed, but then we divide by an epsilon, so we get 2 times 3 factorial on the bottom and epsilon squared on the top, plus some higher order terms. So this is a particularly nice way of expressing this, because we're only really interested in very small values of epsilon locally near zero, so we get divided by 3 factorial with epsilon squared plus some higher order terms. You'll see that our function then, this expression, is going to be positive when the third derivative at zero is positive, taking epsilon small enough, this is going to be the dominating term. And it's going to be negative when the third derivative is negative. So we've proven then that this is positive when the third derivative at zero is positive, and it's going to be negative when the third derivative is negative. So not really working very rigorously there, but we've shown that our original geometric interpretation does appear to be valid under some simplifying assumptions. So when the third derivative is actually equal to zero, it's indeterminate here. So you could have a look at a couple of examples. So for example, if you had f of x was equal to x squared, the third derivative is equal to zero there, and this would actually be symmetrical around the normal. Whereas if you looked at something like f of x is x squared plus x to the 5, so substituting into this expression, we're now determined by the fifth derivative of our function, and here we would be stretched out in one direction, whereas if you had f of x equals x squared minus x to the 5, we would be stretched out in the other direction. So we can actually have symmetry, we can be stretched to the left or stretched to the right, depending on what happens with the fifth derivative.